Hey, hey. We're on. We're back. It's a Sunday afternoon. It's a Sunday. We're in my office today. Different location. New location, new energy. Who dis? Oh, we can turn this up a little bit. We can be a little louder for these people. The wavelengths aren't too loud. Uh, and we should put automatic level control on. Uh, and we're about to have a, a scary movie extravaganza after this. <laughs> extravaganza is so extreme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched a horror film in... Uh, look, it would be like maybe maybe like almost 10 years. Mm. So I am <laughs> very curious to see how this goes. Are you scared? No, I don't feel scared yet, but... It's more like curious because I stopped watching horror films because they impact me. Well, they did impact me quite negatively. So I was like, well, why keep watching them? <laughs> then, you know, just stop. <laughs> yeah. But since I'm doing research for a new film clip, yes, I decided let's dive in and do some healing in my psyche okay. as we do. So it's it's research for art. Exactly. And you know me, I will do anything for art. <laughs> if it's for art, I, all the things that I hate, I will do. Uh, I was saying that to Brendan when I first met him. I was like, I would do all of those things in his House of Air music video, but I just don't know if I'd do the fisting for art. Mm. I don't know if I could get fisted for art. I would do it if, like, <laughs> if there was a reason, like, not, like, if there was a compelling part of the narrative or something, or if it was, like, it was going to look amazing on camera. Or, you well, know, like, I you know, you've seen his it. music video, yeah. right? To say yeah. it's back at that time, we're friends with Brendan, who's, but Brent, in an alt- alternative world, Brendan's not just gay. And he's like, Alpha Mama, would you do the fisting scene for me? This is mm. this is the narrative. This is what it's going to look like. Mm. And just feel like you just the perfect fisty. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, but I know that it would take me some time to gear up. You know, like I, I would have to practice because yeah. I'm not... I'm not um, <laughs> I'm not a pro when it comes to fisting. Look, okay. even, I even struggle with anal, if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah. Know? It is what it is. But, I, you know, fuck, if it's art, I'm an art whore, so I have to say yes. Oh, makes me feel devo that I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. And I would, a hundred, I'm more likely to do a fisting scene than a sounding scene. A sounding? Sounding is where they stick rods down your piss hole. Oh. For, for guys. Whoa. Yeah. Is that a kink? Yeah, that's a kink. Whoa. Yeah. Look, I would rather do the fisting scene than the shit on my face in my mouth. So. Oh, I would... The, the ending scene where Brenda gets shit on, I would do that way before... Yeah, we're, All right, well, there's we're a, a deal. different kind of craft. All right. <laughs> you right. do the shit scene I'd let someone shit scene. on my face any day <laughs> before I would let someone shove their whole fist up my ass. Yeah, but, like, when the fist goes in, it's like you start with the fingers and then eventually it's like, you know, it's tapered until you get to the fist. I mean, I've had a baby, so, like, <laughs> you I know, have shit stretches. You know. <laughs> hey. Uh, well, you know, this uh, this uh, this podcast is brought to you by Brenda McLean's House of Air. <laughs> yeah, you should go watch it. Go stream it. It's on go, Vimeo. Vim, you have to go to Vimeo to watch the music video because it wasn't allowed on YouTube. Uh, it's been reviewed by many, many, many places, including the New York Times, so... It is not safe to watch in workplaces, for no. sure. Yeah, definitely. If you have a conservative religious family, don't go sit around the dinner table and show mm. them this film clip. So, <clears throat> just off, I guess off the back of art, last night I went and performed in Missy's, oh, okay, yeah. offerings. SKV. Um, yeah, subculture, vulture, immersive theatre thing. That was the first time I've done, like, an immersive theatre piece. And to my understanding beforehand, my brief was, like, a few... A couple months ago now, whenever Atlas was here, Mm. was I was just going to be a human consent form. I was just going to be there, I was going to be naked, and people were going to sign as they come into this place of it called Pharmacon. And there was a possibility that I was going to be a part of destroying the stage. 
So then when I got there, Sounds fair. I was like, yeah, I can do that. I am a good, I volunteered to be the naked person. And yeah, I was like, I can destroy. I love destroying. <laughs> Easy. And then I rock up there. I'm like, hey, Missy, what's up? Um, anything I got to know? Um, and she's like, yep. Okay. So there's this outfit for you and you're going to be introducing people in there. You're going to be running down this hallway causing chaos and scaring people and then I and, and you moving people into the space and I'm going to come down from the second level on a cage that's going to be lowered and you're going to be rustling the thing and then you're going to unhook me from the cage oh God. move me through the audience and like I just had all this whole big important role like oh. when the ca- the cage was landing it's like it landed on a hill, so I had to let pull it, and or she would have fell through a garage door. Oh my god! And make sure the hook unhooked at the right. I was like, and she's like, and that's it. And then I was like, I'll see you in a couple hours. I was like, okay, I've just got a five minute brief on a very important role throughout this oh, whole theater piece. That's Missy. She's uh, so hectic. She's so hectic, but you know, I sort of live for that, but yeah. just. At the same time, I was like, okay, I'm very nervous now, you know? Yeah. And my, a part of my role was there's this big, like, renaissance piece going on and these people up on plinths, is that what it's called? Uh-huh. Those, like, those little statue holder things. Uh-huh. Anyways, these incredible movement artists, contemporary dancers are up there doing this very, like, uh, renaissance piece. There's, like, uh, different bowls of wine and feathers going between them and doing this really beautiful dance and the, the crowd are, in, like, enamoured by them. Mm. And I'm the opposite. Oh. I'm moving through the crowd and creeping people out, like, getting up in people's face, like, oh. welcome to Barbican. And, like, I was the agitator, right? Oh. And I was just thinking afterwards, like... To a lot of people, that would be very confronting, right? Yeah. To do, to go do that to people. But I wish a whole lot more people got that chance to understand, one, flow. It's mm. flow. But also, it's a mask. Like, mm. I was a character mm. descend. So, like, you know, and it was signified by my outfit, for one, is mm. like, I'm, I've got a plastic sheet over me, but I'm completely naked. Mm. And the only naked man at this place. So, that sort of signifies that I'm someone that stands out from the rest of the crowd. So it was a certain mask I got to wear. Mm. And I felt like, you know, we talked about identity in previous podcasts. I wanted to talk about that, like, mask and flow that we get to show up in for maybe people that observe us from the outside Mm. and go, how do they show up like Mm. that? Yeah, that's really exciting. I mean, I remember like early days when I first started performing in cover bands and um, there was this one band I sang in for years called Dr. Feelgood and it was like a 70s kind of funk band, you know, with like a horn section and all that. And we would get dressed up in like our 70s costumes. And as soon as the outfit goes on, Mm. it's like, I'm a different person now. Yeah. You know, I can do things that I would never normally do at my own gigs. Mm Mm-hmm as me as a person but because I've got this fucking outfit on because of the context of what it is and I'm in this role performing all of a sudden I'm just like out there and my personality is like times a hundred yes and it's such a permission slip to to step out of who you think you are and step into something where you well it's interesting because you think you're acting you think you're performing but how can you never not be yourself you know, it's like, it's still you, it's mm. just with permission. Yeah, I, I've listened to certain actors talk and they say, like, you're not, like, a good actor isn't acting, they're finding that character within themselves. Yeah. Yes. Totally. And I just think, like, it's so interesting how we often talk about authenticity, like, you know, that's a big buzzword in personal development land. Be authentic, be yourself. It's like, which one? Which <laughs> one? Know? Yeah, there's so many facets to my authenticity. Yeah, and I think... Um, when it comes to like being authentic, I don't, I think a lot of people mistake that for like, well, this is my truth Mm. and I have to defend my truth. And Mm. it's like, well, to me, the more you know yourself, the more fluid you become actually, Yes. the more you're willing to be anything. And that's true authenticity when it's like, I can be anything. Mm -hmm. I am nothing. Mm -hmm. Therefore I can be everything. everything. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, such a fascinating thing of like, 
like I was saying, you put on a 70s outfit and you become that person. Like, I went to this subculture vulture. I don't really know Missy. You know, mm. I've all, in total before this, I've probably had 15 minutes worth of conversation with her. Yeah, you just jumped in. I was, just, I was next to a conversation where she was talking about it and, and she said something about this human consent form and I was just nearby and I was like, oh, I'd do that. You know, like, I'd be a naked person. Uh... And I go to this thing. I knew no one. And I'm in a, my green room was we have like, say like 10 different like professional movement, mm. contemporary dancers, <laughs> all like very trendy, cool people, younger, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then there's me, you know, and I was, I was nervous, you know, like I'm going to be in my first theatre thing I'm not with my crew you know mm. I'm with this other crew mm. and any minute I have to get into costume and, and wait in this room naked with everybody yeah. <laughs> whether in there all this beautiful renaissance gear <laughs> 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 and just yeah just that like and this this big responsibility that I have I'm like this I could I could be part of fucking this up big time mm. and then but there was a part of me that knew soon as it came time, I know there's no such thing as fucking it up for me, yeah. you know? Mm. And there was fuck ups and I, and I Im- like impromptu through it, you know, like, yeah. and, and it was a part of the thing, like mm. certain microphones, certain things, these triggers that I was meant to have didn't go off. So I had to sort of like sort of freestyle my way through mm. my role and just that, like putting on an outfit, being a role, whatever it is, is just, I feel like you can just know once you're in that, that you're not going to fuck it up. I think about like photo shoots that I've done and whatnot. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a phony if I'm going to do this wild businessman or the lover or whatever. Mm. And then when it, you know, I put on the suit and I embody this wild businessman or Mm. a get the women from that lover photo shoot. And I, beforehand, I'm like, who the fuck do I think I am getting two women to f- do this thing with me mm. to pose? Mm. But then it became a ritual mm. moment of because yeah. of those lived truths of mine that I just was captured in it. And it's also, it's archetypal, meaning we carry the blueprint of, um, you know, personalities, identities in our mythological hardware, you know, like... Um, in our in our mythological body, you know, mm. like there's a part of us as humans with culture and society and the way it's been. We've read books, you mm. know, we've we've witnessed each other. We watch TV, watch films. It's like it's in our it's in our cultural imprint that we just know how to access these things because we've seen it because we've lived it. You know, in generations we've lived it, and we see it. We absorb it on this subconscious level. So it's it's all there. Mm-hmm. You know, it is all there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's funny that we like to think that we are only this. Yes. You know? That's the lie, which is really fascinating. Mm. Um, I was thinking about the kids that I teach. So I teach at um, a performing arts high school. <clears throat> and, you know, my job is to help them like, be better songwriters. And, you know, part of, part of that time they're performing, they're musicians. And it's so fascinating to see how some of them are so stuck to their identities um, related to their genre. It's like, I like Uh, this kind of music and this is all I like, you know. And one of their group performances, they had to perform this pop song that they were very critical about. This is like radio pop song. They were like, oh, do I have to play? Do I have to play this song? And I'm like, yeah, you have to. That's the assignment. You know, you've got to do this. And the resistance to that because of their perception of like it's uncool or it's this but I'm a rock player or I'm a this player I don't like this kind of music and I had to just like sit down with them and just have a proper chat about the reality of being a professional musician and what it's actually about versus Mm. what you think it's about Mm. you know actually it's not about like oh I can shred on the guitar or I'm this it's like actually it's about you know how versatile are you Yes. And and not just how versatile are you, like how willing are you to serve the experience as opposed to thinking about what you want, like especially as an artist. Mm. It's not really about you a lot of the time. It's about 
you serving the experience and serving the moment and asking like how can I give myself to this experience and make it a success and that is the mindset that really I think changes you from just being you know as selfish um, you know like art wanker <laughs> to, <laughs> to being an artist mm. yeah it's it's sad uh, I, I would say like there's a balance of it because of sometimes I love moments of incredible indulgence uh, of an artist like mm. I remember when I saw uh, Kanye West and he was performing what's that um, what's the song where uh, Runaway the, and in a music video he's got the Black Swan dances mm. and there's a moment where he just dun 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 in the song and it goes for fucking like two minutes or something in the song but when i seen him live he did it for like five to seven minutes just this same dun yeah dun as we have like three other friends who are not artists i wasn't even you know quote unquote artist back then and i was on the edge of my seat like oh my god like this indulgence this like moment that he's just stretching out and my friends are like why is he doing this mm. I think like it, it does I think you have to be in excellence to be allow yourself to go in indulgence but to reach mm. excellence mm. you have to be versatile you have to meet other people where they're at yeah well I think it's like the thing is like you can't because, you know, there are some people who, like, I only do this. This is all I do. This is my speciality. That's great. Mm -hmm. But you don't really know your speciality until you've tried a bunch of shit. Yes. And you've got to go through that initiation of just, like, trying things and seeing what your thing actually is. And sometimes, like, that includes, like, playing wrong notes yes. or, you know, doing something that doesn't land because that, that informs you, you know, the mm. ugliness. Mm. We have a saying in Indonesian. It's like, you can't... Um, it's like, I can't, I can't even translate it, but it's just like, you can't be beautiful until you've been ugly, you know? Mm. Can you, you say it in Indonesian? I, I can't right now. Uh, <laughs> I can't actually even think of it. It's, it's like an old Javanese quote. So it's like, yeah, when you're learning something, you have to go through that ugly mm. phase mm -hmm. because if you're not willing to go through the ugly phase and you actually mm. can't mm. get good at it, you can't be beautiful. You, it's like, it's, it's part of it, you mm. know? And I saw you uh, share a quote the other day of there's no such thing as writer's block, just artists not willing to write bad lyrics. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's true. That was um, Amy. She's on Instagram. Uh, um, inspired to Write. Inspired to Write, that's right, yeah. She's a dope artist who shares a lot of amazing quotes about, yeah, about creating and mm -hmm. about artistry. Mm -hmm. But that one in particular is, is a big one. I just think, like... You know, and I've been exploring this beauty versus ugly thing for a while. And, you know, partly that's inspired by Atlas with his work in Open, Open World. World. Um, and it's years in the making. But I think as an artist, you know, we because the word aesthetic itself is related to beauty, right? It's like, you know, what we see and we are tending to go for beauty. Mm. But some, somehow we've like mixed up beauty and prettiness mm. as the same thing mm. <laughs> and it's it's like to me like beauty is is such a mysterious thing mm. and the way that you find beauty is so like it's so delicate and it's like it's not always the most obvious thing you know and if you're just going for something that's beautiful without being willing to explore and find a friction point and find like you know, the pockets of ugliness and mess and like weave that together, mm. your art, the outcome will very often be two dimensional, yes. which is the, the difference for me between pretty and beautiful is that beautiful has depth yes. and has substance and has like uh, an intricacy to it or it doesn't even have to be an intricacy, but it has like layers. Mm. Whereas prettiness to me is flat. It's like, it's like, yeah, it's like, it's not, it doesn't have like the depth and the dimension to it. Mm. But that's just my exploration. Who knows if I'm fucking right. Yeah. And I definitely agree that beauty has so much more depth than prettiness. And, you know, fascinatingly, fascinatingly enough, 
I'm, I don't know if we've already talked about this, but I, I am journeying prettiness, you know, mm-hmm. and, and male prettiness and finding the depth in that. I think uh, definitely it's like a conditioning thing that that females have been conditioned into prettiness mm. more than men, like males. So I think there's a depth within prettiness for men to explore versus like a- a overall beauty, regardless of gender and sex mm. has a deeper depth. But I feel like there is a, a, a further dimension to be explored for men, males, mm. uh, around prettiness. Mm. I think partly that's because it's taboo, right? It's taboo. Yes. It's, yes. it's already something that you think you can't be. Mm-hmm. And so just by choosing to be pretty or to explore prettiness, you're already going to come up with so many um, internal and external like limiters mm-hmm. that you have to, you know, you can't, it's like, it's like, oh, what's this one? Okay, we're like, you know, crash that one or mm. move through that one and there's another one that's going to come up, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah, there's there's this offering I want to do around it, but I'm waiting for my clothing label, which is a big thing I have to get done this year. Hmm. I want to speak about that, like putting things out into the world as well. I can see we're getting a bit quiet yeah, on here. That. I didn't turn it up a little bit. Uh, is manifestation and like putting that out into the world because at the start of the year I had six things. That I wanted to manifest throughout the year, that I wanted to do was be in a theatre, which I've now done, yeah. uh, to release a short film, which I've done, mm-hmm. uh, clothing label, uh, to run a retreat, mm. and I can't remember the others off the top of my head. Oh, an EP, mm. which a very small step has been taken with you. Mm-hmm. And there's one more thing that I can't remember, but like these things felt so far away from me mm. and it's so crazy that like, I think it's this weekend as well. Like I'm, I released a short film earlier in the year mm. and this weekend I'm in a film festival. Mm. Yeah. Either of those things I didn't plan. Like yeah. I had already filmed that short film, but I didn't even realize that mm. it was a short film. Mm. And the other one that's in this film festival was plucked off my Vimeo and someone was like, hey, can you... A private Vimeo mm. uh, that I hadn't shared with anyone. Hey, can we share this in our film festival? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I'm curious <laughs> to hear about your year's manifest- manifesting <laughs> and, and <laughs> like putting that out into the world to create these identities, mm. these masks, these realities, whatever you want to call it, into mm. your world. Well, before I share about that, something that came up while you were speaking was this, like... It's like a chicken and egg sort of like philosophic, uh, I don't know, like contemplation <clears throat> that's been in my head for years. It's like, are we manifesting or are we just really psychic? <laughs> you know? Maybe. It's like, did I set an intention and then the universe conspired with me to make it happen? Or did I just tap into some predestined thing that was already going to happen mm. and I just picked up on that mm. psychically, you mm. know? Yep. Or is it both? Or is yep. it neither? You know, I don't know. But that, that's just something that came um, through yes. what you're speaking. I think uh, it's both. Yeah, I think it's both. Maybe they're the same thing. Maybe they're the same thing. Mm. Okay, so my year... Uh, look, the bane of my existence, which is also <laughs> like my fucking, you know, beloved, um, is my album. Love Honey Fire. I was going to yeah. say Lunny. Lunny. <laughs> Lunny. Lunny. Honey Fire is, you know, this fucking work, uh, like this, you know, and I, I've been calling it a body of art. I don't like to call it a body of work. Uh, it's, that's a good reframe. Yeah, it's a body of art. And... You know, sometimes I curse myself. I'm like, why can't I just be a fucking normal artist and just like make art, make pop songs and whatever. But maybe I'm also othering myself when I say that. <laughs> um, what I mean is every song that I write and every song that I record fucking initiates me mm. and teaches me and it becomes a teacher to me. 
And so, you know, I've got these 19 pieces on this record that have just been solidly kicking my ass for the last two years as I continue to create this body of art. And so that was one of the things that, you know, I wanted to finish last year, didn't get finished last year. And then this year, um, it's like literally about to be mastered. So it's like, it's it's pretty much finished. Um, The track order's done and all that stuff. So that was one thing. There were lots of other things that I wanted to um, do, but it's funny, you know, this year, the biggest thing that I wanted to manifest, because you know, last year I was depressed as fuck, like I nearly killed myself. It was a big deal. Um, Last year it was horrible. This year, like my primary intention was just to feel good Mm. on a basic level. Mm. I was like, I'm sick of putting my happiness in the future like somewhere in the future when I finish my album, when I get married or when I have children or when I move to fucking world of the tropical paradise, I want to live in, <laughs> then I'll be happy. Yes. Then I'll be myself and always putting it in the future was made me suffer. Mm. Um, and then this year I was like, no, actually what I want is to live a foundational practice that actually makes me feel happy mm. and be unapologetic about that. And yeah, part of that was like exercise and eating right, which I fluctuated on. But the big thing that is actually what I've discovered, which is fucking vital to my well-being and happiness is intimacy. Mm. And that's one thing that I was just like in early Jan- in January when... I decided, fuck it, like, I'm just going to prioritize that. I've just been having so much sex. And Mm. that is what is giving me so much pleasure and enjoyment and fueling so many of my other things. I got a business coach. Um, I've been making, like, pretty consistent, like, 10K months, you know, this whole year, which is amazing. And I don't feel like I've been working very hard because I've just focused on stay in pleasure and stay Mm. in feeling good and stay in that, like, basic just fucking be happy Mm. and seems to be working nice yeah and frequency happened like you know like which was like you know i've been wanting to make this fucking record label for years and i've tried god queen this and blah 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 and try to collaborate with people and even try to collaborate with nadine for years and you know our journey (laughs) has been such a struggle (laughs) yes because i'm have seen it already in my mind Mm. so i try to create it but me trying to create it from my ego, it always fails. And I had to let it go and let it go. And then we created Frequency. We got the grant for that. And that's become really successful. Now we just signed a lease on a studio, you know, and that's Frequency Studio. And eventually that I, I'm i guessing is going to become a record label, you know, mm. where we develop and release artists. And it's like, when I try to do it my way, <laughs> it doesn't work. But when I let go, yes, that's when it actually flows. Yes, and just I just need to, and that's what I've learned this year is like pull back from the long term, big picture, big vision. Like just let it go, let it die, uh. be unattached to that and what that looks like, and actually just give a fuck about like how am I feeling in this present moment, and what can I do to make sure that I feel good and I like like my life. Mm. That's it. And the rest is just kind of coming together as it needs to. That's Epic. it. <laughs> Epic. So you're saying that it derives from the feeling. For me personally, yeah. You know, I was always addicted to my big picture fantasies, like addicted, mm. you know, and that was what made me happy was thinking about who I was going to be in the future and what I was going to have in the future. Mm. But I was suffering because I could never meet that. You weren't that person yet. I wasn't. And it, therefore, I was just like, I'm not that right now. And I'm a failure and I'm a flop. Whereas now it's like, I let that future vision die. She's dead. I don't care if she ever manifests or not. I don't care if I ever have fucking multi-million dollar companies and drive a Tesla and like all of this shit. It's like she can suck my dick. She's done. <laughs> like I'll, what I care about right now is like how connected do I feel to my life right now? Mm. You know, am I actually prioritizing What gives me joy and pleasure? Am I like, or or not just joy and pleasure, if I'm heartbroken, am I in my heartbreak? Mm. Like, am I actually feeling it? Am Mm. I actually learning from it? Am I breathing it? Am I processing it? Am I digesting it? Mm. And that's more what I care about now, which is proving to be very successful for me because I've been heartbroken so many times this year and I'm like, it's fine. (laughs) You know, it's beautiful. I love it. 
Mm. So fascinating. Like, obviously, I've said I've had these goals for the year, but they're not like goals like that are long term. As in, like, it's not like create an EP and become a massive pop star, or do a retreat and become someone that does retreats all across the world, or start a clothing label and have flag stores all across Australia, whatever it is. Mm. None of that. It's just like, just do this thing. And I love that, but I feel like my trajectory of what I'm trying to work on, which is just so difficult and such a foreign language to me, is to actually have a future plan. Like, mm. what is the end goal? Like, sense, fight, music. Mm. Like, I knew what I wanted to do with fight, music, and where I wanted it to go, and what, I, like, I sort of had a loose understanding of where a record label should go and, and how that should look, people to study, etc. But this trajectory that I'm on now, I'm, like, just each day at a time, like, mm. what is it that I want to do? What feels like the record? next move you know mm. i talked to a business coach the other day and then he's like oh yeah just asking me questions some um, he's like you know how much are you making and i'm doing around a roughly 10k a month as well and a little bit less some 10k some not and you know things are like base level good mm. but no f- future trajectory no like sustainable foundations laid down and like what a sort of comfortable end goal is or not even end goal but like what is going to have me set up Mm. uh yeah Yeah. i've really been trying to figure that out and to be someone that can plan Mm. my future it's like you and i are needing to get a bit of that transmission from one another like i just can't imagine like what I want my, like, a long-term relationship to look like, what kind of house I want to live in or where I want to live or Mm. what my business should be, anything like that. That's Mm. so foreign to me at this moment. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But do do you want to know? Well, my words for the year are stability and immortality. Mm. So... Stability, a big part of it is, yeah, that I have a st- stable ground that I know this amount will be coming in mm. weekly, fortnightly, monthly, whatever, uh, that this will be able to be done for a decent period of my life, like that I have a stable home for this amount of time. Like, you know, the, like this house I live in now, I don't know when the fuck we're going to get kicked out, you know, mm. we're not on the lease anymore and they don't know when they're going to be developing it. Mm. And yeah, like the spiral is great for making money and whatnot, but just, I don't know how long I want to be doing eight week programs for the rest of my life. Mm. You know, Mm, mm, mm. these things, Mm. you know, I don't know how sustainable Mm. and how much stability they provide in my life. Well, to me, like, it sounds like you integrated the stability and what is the reason you want stability? Like it's foundations, right? Mm-hmm. When you have foundations, if your foundations are strong, then you can start building high. Mm. You can scale. That's what people like to talk about, scaling your business. It's mm. like you can build upwards, but if your foundations are shit, mm. then anytime you try to have big vision and go for it, it just crumbles because there's no stability. And I feel like, yeah, like it's like level one, complete, you know, mm. ticked off, success, mm-hmm. know how to support myself. I know how to you know, have that level of stability, which is fucking awesome. And then, yeah, like now you actually get to, and you know, maybe like, I don't know. I kind of believe like on some higher level, we always know. Yeah. Yes. And that's what I have to trust. You know, Mm. I sit in that unknown, you know, of like figuring out what's going to happen. Like, I don't know, Mm. but okay. Mm. You know, and that surrender piece is so important. So important. It's like, to me, life is like this dance between knowing and not knowing or like knowing and mystery. Mm. And that's like where the game is. That's like, you know, if you knew everything that was going to happen, it'd be so boring. If you knew nothing at all, it'd be so terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's got to be somewhere in between. And I think that, you know, on some like super conscious spiritual level, 
that's the fun part of being human is mm. like, oh, I hid some things from myself and I don't know where they are and I got to kind of find them. And then you find them and you're like, yeah, like I did it. Mm. You know, it's like we're all playing hide and seek with each other, yes. you know, but we actually know where we are, but that's the game of it. Mm. And I think it's like when I work with clients and even with myself, you know, I have that magic question that I use all the time. It's like, well, if you did this on purpose, mm. why would that be? Yes. And I do that with my clients all the time. It's like, you know at your fucking core mm. at the total like cause point of you as a spiritual being you know what you're doing mm. but you need to have this level of i don't know in order to be invested in your life to make it a fun game mm. but anytime you're stuck you can literally just put your finger back in that socket of knowing and you mm. can get the information that you need mm. Mm. if you're actually willing to see it yeah and hear it I do, a thing I'm pretty sure I got from you that I do with my clients is like when you ask the reframe questions of like, for instance, if you could feel the fear, uh, yeah, if you felt the fear, what's the question? Do that, it anyway. Yeah, and do it anyways. Yeah, if you could feel the fear and do it anyways, yeah. like how would your life be different? And someone's like, oh, oh I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And then I ask the question. What if you did know? Yeah. What if you did know? Yeah. They're like, ah, oh, it's this, you know, it's just so e like just so crazy how easy you can just cut so through much bullshit. the bullshit. There's and just, so many hacks. And how often, you know, I have to do it to myself. It's like, oh, I don't know what to do. It's like, what if I did know? Oh, okay. I just got to do this. You That's know? it. You know, sometimes I like, I'll <laughs> like count down with my clients when there's a lot of story and a lot of bullshit and like, I don't know, confusion. I'm just like, all right, I'm going to count down to zero and I'm going to click and you're going to fucking tell me mm. and it's like three, two, one, click and then it just bleh, the yeah. truth comes through and I'm like so maybe you fucking did know, uh, <laughs> you know? and a lot of the times there's people knowing but not wanting to say it you know it's That's sitting it. there and like no or it's like no it's not that it's not that it's something Can't else and they're that. looking looking for something else Yeah. because maybe it doesn't make sense to them at the time and then they say and you're like yeah this this and they're like oh fuck I didn't think about it that way mm-hmm. sometimes the knowing is so quick we overlook it as well. Mm -hmm. That can happen. Like I'll have like clients where I'll ask them the question and then the answer will come, but then the associations of that answer come up and that's more present to them. So they'll start speaking about, Oh, but then, so it's like, for example, like, mm, you know, uh, what would you, you know, how would you be living differently if you didn't give a fuck about what anyone thought of you? Mm. Right. So the answer comes through, but the thing that immediately happens after that is like, I would, say what I think and be a bitch and people will hate me and then I'll lose all my friends. So they'll go to like, oh, but then I'll, I'll lose all my friends and, and I won't have any friends anymore and people mm. will hate me. And I'm like, okay, so what happened before that? Like, mm. you know, like what was the answer that came through that led you to that? And then they go like, kind of got to rewind yeah. a bit. And it's like, oh, well, what came through was that I would really be speaking my mind and I, and I would actually start telling people what I think about them. And then, you know, it's like, oh, okay, so let's go back to that. And how would that feel? You know, yeah. but sometimes we're so afraid of the truth that wants to come through that we'll just conveniently overlook it. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating thing. And, and, you know, another thing that I grabbed from you is doing group spiral at the moment. And, you know, such a big change from doing one-on-one -on -one, because a lot of people, they don't have a crew like us, you know, that's like all this, like, we love personal development. We love pushing our edges. We love trying new things. We love showing up in new ways, etc. A lot of people don't have that. And when you pluck, you know, 10 people and put them in a group together and go, you guys are all on the same journey right now for the mm. next eight weeks. Mm. Just how much of a difference it's given. Because sometimes I have these integration tasks and people don't have them to do them with. Mm. It's like it, it, when I do one-on-one -on -one sessions... But plucking just a motley crew of people and going, hmm. and they're all like doing their integration tasks together and showing up and, and I think being witnessed, hmm. no matter who it's from in, in these new versions of yourself or this questioning and, and then having someone go, oh shit, me too, actually, hmm. or hey, that, I've journeyed that. It's just so important to mm. be able to do that mm. i guess that's the premise of this right now is like we're sharing those parts of ourselves to have the i needed this today and that's what the group looks like in my like in a little whatsapp mm. chat with each other someone shares something and then they 
going off and I'm just watching and, it's, and they're like, oh, shit, I really needed this today, you know? And they're providing that for one another. Is yeah. so special. I think that's a big part of um, your growth and evolution. Like, I call it the holy trinity, you know, when you're on a growth path. You have to have people that you look toward, you know, your teachers, your mentors, like the people that are, I guess, guiding you in some way. Um, they've, they've walked the road that you're walking in yes. some way. And then you also have to have your peer group. These are people who are on your level, who you can turn to, who you can like discuss ideas with, and you're learning from each other, but you're doing it from the place of like, a, we're peers, you know, mm. where we're on the same level. And then for me to complete that loop, it's like you always have to be passing that knowledge on yeah. and becoming the teacher and teaching and sharing and mentoring. And that's like how you really integrate your journey successfully. If you're missing any one of those layers, mm. then to me, that's where things start to get um, a bit out of alignment. You know, like I have um, one of my clients who has been struggling for a little while because she's got teachers and mentors. She's done a bunch of like learning and programs, whatever. She's got friends, she's got her peers, but she's not passing on the knowledge Anything. and she knows that she needs to. So she's like a fucking bottleneck. She's yeah. got all of this stuff in her soul, like deeply wants to serve and share and she's just not doing not it. Not showing up. Yeah, and she feels like shit. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's time for me to get a mentor again. I've not died, not done, been in any other programs for a while. I had a therapist for a while, but I think I'm done with him, which was great. You know, that was like a new version of mentoring, having a psychotherapist. Mm. I think for the moment I'm good, and maybe I'll go back to him. But sure. yeah, definitely keeping an eye out for that part of the Trinity. I love that. I've not heard the Trinity before. Yeah, like I think, you know, on some level we probably always are doing it, but to do it intentionally yes. is different. Like I last year I didn't have a coach all of last year. I was fucking failing. I was flailing, you know. Yeah. I was nearly dead. I had peers and even then that started to get rocky. There was one point where I felt like I had no friends and mm. there was a bunch of shit going on there. Uh, but I was always teaching and I was always, you know, sharing and delivering. So in that respect yeah look i i still felt valuable mm. as a person on the earth mm -hmm. um but as soon as i got a new coach this year changed the game yeah. for me yeah just like having someone who can sit with you in your bullshit and hold a really fucking clear space for you to just like hear yourself and feed it back to you and then help you get clarity on what the fuck you're gonna do next it's mm. like oh my god this is so valuable yeah and i 10x my investment you know yep well easily yep uh yeah that's definitely lingering around for me it's nice i just went to um someone had shared on their stories like a a quote from Danny Redbard and he had like this whole new branding system going on and I went over to his profile and like saw who he was being like who his coaches are and this new program that he just went and done and got some new tools and I was like fuck man like I always forget how valuable it is just to go out and get some new tools you know mm. like not just to feel complacent with the ones that you've got like just to go oh yeah I got these and that's good like you went out and got some new tools and mm. Just that, that gusto that you get with it, like, oh, i got to go out and deliver this to the world. And I'm like, yeah, good, Danny. You know, I was, I was really happy to see that. And I feel like that's maybe getting a little stagnant in my life right now of just, uh, you know, I love doing the spiral and, you know, I've got a, got a funeral tour coming up. But it's like, what else can I put in my tool bag mm. now that's going to make me want to share more and, and give me more depth of myself to share because I think you know I love doing personal development on my own and going into my own shadows and discovering new parts of myself and I think it's very important to do that after you get some new tools mm. the last one was sort of when I went and did ISTA and I feel like that is now okay I've discovered all that I needed out of going and doing ISTA mm. and I'm going to do ISTA again and there's always more to get but what else now? What is another tool that I can get? And I'm still mm. figuring that out. Mm -mm. I've been thinking about that a lot lately as well. Like what I've been called to, um, a few things come to mind. One is I really want to get back into massage mm. and I want to um, start 
I feel like I really want to do like yoni and lingam massage. Mm. Like I really want to go down the sexual path and step into that more because I think it's something that I have a natural interest in. It's like, obviously I love sex. I love intimacy, but also I just, when I had my first yoni massage, I was just like, fuck, this feels ancient. It feels important. It feels like things that we just would have done Mm. when sex wasn't shameful and wrong and taboo. We just would have provided this for each other because it's so healthy and healing and it's non-sexual. It's not like, Ooh, you like me and I'm turning you on. It's not, it's like fucking healing, you know, it's therapeutic. So that's something that I feel like is calling me. And then the other thing is Chinese medicine as well. Mm. Like I've always been into um, herbs and natural healing, you know, and I think um, adding maybe acupuncture and some actual like study of five element theory would be great for me. And then I also just, I want to deepen in my magic. Yes. Just for my for my transmission as an artist, like I've always had this picture of myself, like this, you know, vision of being on stage and people having like spontaneous healings, you know, yes. and people like fully just having epic like releases and coming out feeling completely transformed and renewed. And I already have that to a degree, mm-hmm. but I want that to a high level. Mm. Like I want to like really create like incredible like magic miraculous Mm. experiences Mm. i'm curious in an earlier podcast episode you said because i was talking about wanting to do porn art porn Mm. having only fans etc and you're like you'd love to do that but you can't because you worry about river Mm. and your parents where does that fall in around yoni and lingam massage so it's interesting like because the premise is therapeutic and Mm -hmm. because it's private Mm -hmm. i don't feel that there's any issue there yeah there won't be documentations of the actual act exactly but like you know there's a film with me fucking someone on the internet that they could watch Mm -hmm. that was where i feel it would be hard for them how would you feel about promoting it online yeah, I don't have any problem with that. Okay, cool. That's totally fine. I think because it falls to me under the banner of like therapeutic healing and yep. and as long as they don't see it, yep. I think it's, yeah, that's my, probably my line there. But, you know, that could change for me. Like, who knows? You know, I'm, I'm super open. And I often think about what will change when my parents die eventually. Yeah. I think as shitty as it sounds to say, but I do think that that will be an extra form of permission for me to live more freely because I'm not worried about their reputations anymore or any of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Quick subject change. Yeah. So the other day I was watching news. So why would you do that? Tim watches like there's, so he watches these two news media platforms. One is like, there's like this, um, were you paying attention? I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's like a panel of of comedians, Australian comedians, and there's this guy that like the panel host and he's like plays a little clip of like a news section and then it's like, you know, uh Princess I don't know any of them. I'm gonna say Diane, I even know I know she's dead. <laughs> went to you know, on the weekend, went and visited Denmark to do and like what? And people like to go crash a car, uh, no, to do this, to do that, right. but then they actually this, you know, and it's, so it's like to make jokes, but then also sort of deliver okay. the news in a way, you know. Gotcha. So there's that, and then there was also another one, this ABC one, where it's essentially like a guy. It's like a news thing where they like pluck other news bits and make fun of it, like just to show how contradictory it is. Mm. But still, every, like, one in 15 people weren't a white old man in a suit. Mm. And I was just like, where are people that are alternative to that? You know, like, whether it's of colour or it's a woman or, like, just wearing something that's not a suit that has tattoos or something like that. And, And lately I've been going past, like you know, Ole or, like, uh, Pantene Pro-V and different ads. And I'm like, there's not... Where are the tattooed people or where are the mm. coloured people? Like, 
and there is more people of colour getting in advertising, but does this gloss that's mm. always over? Mm. It's the prettiness, the pretty facade. The pretty facade. Like, mm. I really want to get into mainstream platform things where I can be alternative. Like, I will be another white male on these things, mm. but... I have tattoos and and queer, or and I would not wear a fucking suit, you know. Like, or if it was, it has to be something extra. I really desire to see that in the world. So, mm. the, the people that that consider them our selves outcasts, such as myself, have no choice but they'd like. Sorry, you're not an outcast anymore because you're all over mm. mainstream media. Mm-hmm. You are actually included. You don't have to live this outcasted life, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. You don't have to feel like you're different because of you are represented. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting one, isn't it? Like, I just don't watch mainstream media at all. Like, I don't, I don't, unless I'm at my parents' house, it's TV's always on. Um, and yeah, I just like, I forget, you know, like, obviously, like, my my immediate family, my mom, dad, my brothers, my son, they're very, um, societal people as in like they live in the paradigm of modern society western society but other than that i live like pretty outside of that and i forget how toxic it is Mm -hmm. within that society and how like much conformity is shoved down our throats and like how and you know and like I listen to some of the things that my mum says or my dad says and I'm just like, wow, this is what I came from, you know? Yeah, yep. It's incredible and, like, yeah, I don't know. I just think, like, I don't... I don't have any desire to... to even dip my toe into that realm, Um, you know? I don't. Like, I just don't care because I don't watch it so it doesn't have any value for me. For me, you know, I, I talked about this a lot when more of my, like, phase of, quote-unquote, coming out, but mm-hmm. more of my conversations around queerness in the earlier stages of, like, I didn't know David Bowie was bisexual and there was no conversation around that. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't know, like, Billy Joel Armstrong from Green Day was bisexual and all these people, like... I didn't know that there was this alternative way of living Mm. uh, because I thought you were either gay or straight, for instance, Mm. you know? I didn't know that bisexual was a choice. I thought it was binary, you know? Mm. So I chose straight. And, like, I I think of... You mean you didn't know it was an option? You didn't know it was an option. I think of younger people that live in houses where... It's just the news. It's just home and away. It's just whatever mm. that a yearning to just see that person pop up that goes, oh, that's one of my people. You know, mm. like your moment where you saw something that was like those bohemian people living, mm. you know? Mm. They go, oh, mm. those are my people. How do I get there? But imagine if more alternative people had platforms so people would go, oh, that's my person, mm. you know? Like, yeah. I'm, I just, like, when I was watching that like that news the other day i was having problems with it Mm. and i was just imagining you know like i just there's always these more and more layers like the empathy that i could never fully understand but i just was like there was not one person of color Mm. you know i just imagine being a person of color grows up in australia Mm. or america or wherever but here in australia is my experience Mm. and people that i can semi empathize with of like that every day i just couldn't imagine it it's so like i remember a few moments watching um tv growing up or even with movies and if ever there was like an asian or a mixed race person i would feel like a strong affinity for them like um i remember what you i think it was home and away what is it neighbors there was one chick who looked like she was some kind of mixed race Asian. Like she was definitely like had some kind of Asian mix with something else. And she had a very unique face. And I just remember feeling like, oh, that's me. You know, there's like a, there's like a part of me that's like, oh, that's me, you know? And just like how much it stuck out in my mind and how different it was Mm -hmm. because, you know, predominantly it's white people. And I was like, oh, wow. 
it just felt like out of the ordinary yeah you know? and it shouldn't be out of the ordinary yeah but it's that's what it is out of the ordinary there was you know and the pressure that comes with that that you are all of a sudden representing a whole community because there's just one of you you know mm. in this area like mm. i was watching so tim and his roommate watch rupaul drag race and they're doing australian rupaul drag race right now and there was an indigenous person on there and they were very much like i am the first indigenous person on rupaul drag like aboriginal australian mm-hmm. indigenous on rupaul drag race and they were the only one and they had a massive weight on their shoulders mm-hmm. and they did this epic look at one point i think like they represented i can't remember but it was like the bushfires and as they were walking back down the the catwalk thing they like spread their wings out and it had the like always was always will be and that was like an iconic moment mm. that would have meant so much to so many people mm. and also unfortunately there was just a lot of mistakes about their outfit mm. and in the first round they were gone oh that's a shame and like but they were like that that pressure of like oh that's but i'm true. the only ind- i needed to be here you mm. know but mm. that yeah. was but they got at least they had that one moment but mm. it's like there's yeah. not enough diversity to mm. to go, oh, yeah, don't worry, we've still got another three Indigenous people on this. Yeah. You know, not all the weight is on you. I noticed a big shift last year, you know, when um, the Black Lives Matter movement was really strong. I noticed a lot more black and brown people on TV. Like if I'd go to my mom's place on ads, I'd be like, and, you know, even some of my clients, like Tiana Canterbury, you know, she's nailed so many ads and, you know, it's not that... It's like nothing's changed in her, really. It's like it's just that now all of these companies are like, oh, shit, we should probably, you know, we should probably think more outside the white frame. Like we should Mm -hmm. probably include some more people. Um, But I guess like the thing that I'm thinking is like, I hope it's not just um, a tokenistic response to the like to what from there. And it's like, oh, it's trending now. So let's just like do that because it's trending and then later forget about it. And it's the same with, you know, if it's Pride Month and all the companies are suddenly talking about. They've got their rainbow filter on their logo and whatnot. Well, yeah, I was talking to, you know, I had a podcast with Nadine and Jamaz on my other podcast, Curious Mm -hmm. Conversations, about like industry tokenism you know and like what it feels like but overall like both of them it when it came down to it they're like so be it you know like yeah. if you want to tokenize me for me to get an opportunity yeah great you know i will use that you know does it feel good that that's the reason why no but mm. am i going to make the most of this opportunity of unless it's something that's completely like unethically mm. like tokenizing but majority of times like are they tokenizing me? I think so. Mm. I'm going to do it, you know? Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, like I, I think it's funny because I, you know, I'm white passing, um, also straight passing. Um, and so I, it's funny, but like I've always felt like, oh, I'm not white enough to just be seen as white and therefore considered, uh-huh. but I'm not brown enough to be tokenized either (laughs) (laughs) i'm just kind of in the middle that's been my little story you know so it's like yeah i don't get um yeah i don't really get to sit firmly in either world you know in that sense but whatever that's also part of the reason why i just do my own shit you know it's like i build my own fucking platform i do make my own label i'll just produce my own shit you know like all of the opportunities that i haven't gotten that i haven't received um, I, I just, uh, I'll just find a way to do it myself, mm. which I think is good, you know, mm. to, to build that kind of mental resilience and pioneering spirit at the same time. It's fucking exhausting. Yeah. That was a big thing when I remember, was it last year? It must've been last year. Could have been early this year. I can't remember, but, uh, the embodiment conference. Oh yeah. Oof, I literally, they, they had a big deal afterwards, but. You know, it was a platform to half a million people. Mm. And I was literally picked for being queer. <laughs> Can you be our queer representative? It was, yeah, they literally put up a thing like, hey, we're looking to get more 
we've we're fully at capacity we're looking to get more queer people in mm. someone tagged me in it and oh, i was like oh shit this is my first uh it's my first queer gig you know it's my yeah. first token like oh okay i can i can be the token queer person and i made i made up a workshop a, a thing that was like very uh it, like it was extremely queer i was like okay you want it i'm gonna like go a bit like how taboo. to be gay how to be gay <laughs> like but like to go i'm gonna make your comfortable your platform uncomfortable for mm. for tokenizing mm. i'm gonna go really out there with the queerness which mm. was really fun to do cool that's cool i remember sending a message it was actually like last year in the middle of like all of this you know everything was like fully up in the air and there was this masculine summit i think it was um a huge like spiritual uh, online conference about masculinity like you know and that mm. whole shit and I looked at the poster and I scanned there were like so many facilitators and presenters some men like uh, some women as well even among like all the men and I'm like I don't see one black person on uh, this whole yeah shit. I do remember that happening yeah and I sent a message to the guy whose event it was I was like hey like I just wanted to message you and um, bring to your awareness that like there is not a single black man facilitating in your masculinity conference and I'm curious as to why that is mm. and he was like oh well to be honest with you I just don't know any who do this work and I was like well firstly that's your fault yeah. and secondly here's a list of men that you can approach you know black men that you can approach and I hope that you do and it's just like it's it's a problem. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a fucking problem. It's like and it's uncomfortable, you know, to see that and and then sometimes when there is an attempt in certain communities um, to diversify, it's done in uncomfortable ways. Like sometimes I see, you know, even our friends who are like coaches or spiritual leaders or whatever, and they want to start advertising to people of color, so they'll just like put up a brown person on their picture, <sighs> like a stock image of a brown person or a black person. I'm just like oh that's not that doesn't feel good in my mm. body that i don't think that's how you do it you know that yeah. doesn't feel right um but you know i can't fault their intention yeah but yeah like it's often just smells a bit on the nose it's a tricky one learning how to diversify yourself if you don't already have that diversity you know like mm. as in like you don't already have a one friend of color to go hey like i'd like to can you help me you know figure out how i should do this ethically you know and people just make mistakes and some people are just not willing to make the mistake as well like mm. like just recently i put a call out to connect into the the disability community because i have a podcast coming up well, i'm gonna record it tomorrow uh and i was like googling and everything i'm like how do i put this call out without it being yeah wrong you know and like the, the words that i got across most platforms was to say the disability community mm. i looked at a lot of people's bios and whatnot and i'm like this doesn't all the way feel right but i'm gonna give it a go mm. and then put it up and i got a lot of good connections from it and you know that's a big part i want to talk about because that's like mm. the disability i've definitely been up on the mm. learning more about people of color indigenous people mm. queer people trans people but the disability community i yeah. still have next to no understanding what goes on there mm. and i feel like that's a lot of people around and it's like mm. ah like there's just another pandora's box of of understanding mm. how to be more inclusive Totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of that as well. And, you know, it's because, well, like, to be frank about it, it's because we don't care, right? If you care, like, you will actually do something about it. But we don't care because we haven't had to care because of our privilege. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I don't have to think about these things nah. because it's not part of my reality, um, which is, it's like, yeah, like, I don't have any malice toward myself for that. That's just is what it is. But part of... I guess part of like becoming more aware is to see beyond yourself and your own, you know, limited experience of life and mm. to, to start to look around and say, all right, well, 
you know, this is my crew of people, but actually the whole fucking human race is my people and everybody is having a completely different experience on this planet. And how can I consider that when I'm living my life and, you know, and and doing what I want to do? I mean, these are all difficult questions to ask yourself, but I think what I learned from last year is to really handle the shame yeah because that was crippling for me last year i've i shrunk a lot you know i was so um i was so like afraid of getting it wrong and so afraid of being misunderstood and so like yeah just hypersensitive to the discussion and not to mention also triggered as well like with you know i'm not a white person even though i'm white passing so there was a lot of stuff that i was also dealing with um and then i really just like i was like fuck this is so difficult i don't i don't know who's on my on my team anymore you know i don't know who's for me i'm lucky that i have really fucking great people who i mm. like kept me sane and strong people like yana yaniso yeah. like amazing fucking humans in my life um but this year it's like i really have like anchored this kind of knowing that i'm fucking doing my best if someone says my best isn't good enough cool they yeah. can think that and yeah. they can fully believe that my best doesn't mean that i don't have room for improvement my best doesn't mean that you know i can't grow i can't learn of course like i'm so open to that and i'm so open to learning and being corrected when that's when that's necessary and when that's there mm. but i can't operate from a place of i fucked up it's so, i'm so bad i'm ashamed of myself like i should just give up my platform it's like that's so mm. fucking stupid to do yeah. that like yeah. I don't want to do that. I don't want to lower myself in order to make space at the table. Like I believe that we can actually raise each other up rather than chopping ourselves down. Yes. That's a big thing I got from, I listened to a podcast with Brene Brown and to keep that like attitude correct around building each other up and, and believing the best in people that is, she asked, do you believe there was a study, um, that she did, do you believe people are doing their best? Mm. And if you say no, your life is going to be a whole lot harder. Mm-hmm. Of course, because you're going to look around at everyone suspiciously yeah. and always like criticizing and thinking that they're, 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 they don't, you know, they're not trying. Mm-hmm. That That's a game changer for me. And that, you know, I think we covered that in our last podcast. We were talking about like not believing that people are inherently evil. Yes. Like Mm. believing that people are inherently good Mm. and that they're operating from wounding and operating from dysfunction and, you know, distortion and all that stuff, but they're inherently good. And I think that whether it's true or not doesn't even matter because it's beneficial. Yeah. To have that mindset. Yeah. Exactly. more healthy. Totally. I need a wee so bad. I felt like that was the ending anyways. (laughs) That's one hour. All right, peeps. We love you. We love you. Looking forward to hearing um, your positive critique only. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. This is episode five. We really got to get the branding and the photos and get this out to the people so we're not so far behind. (laughs) Oh, ahead in a way. Ahead, yeah. Both. Well, because then if we release it like months later, it won't be relevant anymore. Well, we haven't done any topical things as in pop culture moment things. We've just been talking about life. Yeah, our our life. Our yeah. life and our views. <laughs> All right. Mwah. Peace. Goodbye.